great, but we had lots of connections in that small town and still have lots of connections in that small town. And it didn't take me long to just uh, be crazy about her. She's such a wonderful person, such a dear friend, such a passionate, faithful person, uh, and uh, is just an inspiring speaker. And so, Louise, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. She is a Methodist pastor. She was educated at uh, Cameron School of Theology, was a registered nurse before she went into ministry, and uh, has done a lot of things. And she's <laughs> all about it. So come oh, on. Come on over, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to sell the Episcopal Church so he could build a great big new one down the street. And the Methodist bought it. And so we became great friends. We bought his church. <laughs> it was great fun to be in ministry and coming to with him and the Episcopalians. And I tell you the truth, I would be an Episcopalian. I love, I'm a Pharisee to the nine. <laughs> and I love the fact that you have printed material and things are done decently and in order. I, I can't remember to bob when you weave and all those things, but I can learn. <laughs> I can learn. I can do that. Vestments are beautiful. But I'm always afraid when I do the Lord's Prayer. I'm always afraid. Every time I say it, I think, don't mess it up, don't mess it up. Because I'm so afraid, I will say, and lead us into temptation instead of lead us not into temptation. So when it's printed before me, I know I won't forget it. <laughs> it's, it's Advent, and you've only got a certain amount of time. And so I don't want to bore you with talking about me uh, or telling you about history in Covington and all that sort of stuff. Because we just got a little bit of time, and this is the first luncheon in Lent. I'm sure you did Ash Wednesday. Um, we did. Actually, I was invited to help at uh, Covington First, and so we had Ash Wednesday. And then I asked the people at Bread and Butter, which is like the local Starbucks. <laughs> they have better food, but local Starbucks. If I could come there next year for an hour and impose ashes as people stop by for their coffee, and they said I could. So next year in Covington, for the very first time, we're going to have sidewalk ashes. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be legal. <laughs> uh, so that's going to be quite fun. Um, because it's the first luncheon, that you're having in Lent. I'm going back and start with the transfiguration because that's really when Jesus came down off that mountain is when he set his face toward Jerusalem. And so that's a good place to start. How many of you gave up something for Lent? Oh look, they're, they're fudging, I know they are. How many, how many of you added something for Lent? That's so good that you do that because it's not about making a sacrifice uh, and, and just dropping it and you walk around shuffling your feet and knowing that Sunday's coming and you get a Jubilee day and all that sort of thing. <laughs> it's about breaking a bad habit or changing a behavior or putting in uh, to the food pantry if you're going to fast or all those things. It's about drawing closer to Christ. How many pastors or ministers are or priest in the room. Oh boy, howdy. Okay, I better, be, I better hurry. <laughs> better hurry. I'm so glad you're here. I almost wore a collar today. In the Methodist Church, it's not our custom uh, to wear a collar all the time, but I found out very early on that I couldn't get out of the hospital parking lots because they didn't believe I was a preacher. Um, and so I started wearing a collar so we have to pay for parking. <laughs> <laughs> and I wear them very often, even now. If I go to the jail, I wear them because they still don't believe I'm a preacher. When they go to jail. <laughs> In Luke uh, chapter 9, it tells us a few things we need to hear. I'm going to begin at verse 28. Now about eight days after these uh, sayings, Jesus had been in a teaching frenzy. 
He took with him Peter and James and John, and they went up the mountain to pray. And while they were praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory, and they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory, and the two, remember that Sunday morning, when you're weighed down with sleep, you'll miss the glory if you're not off. So stay away. It says so right here. It says so. Master, Peter said to Jesus, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came over and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then came from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent. And in those days they told no one any of the things that they had seen. Now, Episcopalians do a few things different from the Methodists, and you know from the news that the Methodists is going through a nervous breakdown right now. <laughs> Where's my Methodist friend? Where are you? There you are. <laughs> but you know, your father was a Methodist preacher. You know that we've gone through nervous breakdowns before. We do this about every 50 to 75 years. First it was over slavery. Then it was... Then we had a split, and then it was over segregation, and then it was over women being ordained. And we go through these nervous breakdowns every once again. I'm hoping we pull out of this one. We want to beat the bad guys. Um, the problem is change is very, very hard, and it's hard for everybody. It's hard for Methodists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians. It's hard. It's just hard. Uh, when when we face change, it becomes life-changing. And so it's tough. It's a tough thing. Um, my nursing and probably my personality have brought a lot of people into my pathway. Being a Methodist preacher and the bishop moving us around in our conference, and my conference is North Georgia, which means everything from Macon and back this way, uh, and to the state lines. She can move us anywhere within that area. And so Methodists kind of used to change. And sometimes you're glad to go and kiss the county line. <laughs> and sometimes it just breaks your heart to have to move. But it brings a lot of people through. Some people you want to remember forever and ever. Others you wish you could forget. <laughs> <laughs> I love to people watch and I like to gain access to people's stories because everybody has a story and their story is unique to them and it cannot be duplicated by anybody else. One of the people that crossed my path when I was still in nursing and was a young mother is a man named Mr. Fuller. You would not have known him. He was from the Almond area of Newton County. Spelled almond, pronounced almond. He lived in a tent, and he had made himself a wooden floor out of pallets. Do you know what a pallet is? Okay. He lived on land that was not his, but the people that owned that land had cows behind him and on each side of him, and so they never ran him off. They let him stay there <laughs> in this tent. And he couldn't burn anything down except the tent. <laughs> He had no plumbing, he had no electricity, and on really bitter, bitter cold nights, I fretted over Mr. Fuller. I would see him walking, and he always had on a ton of clothes that he got out of a dumpster someplace. He always smelled bad, and my boys, Matthew and Marcus, uh, would say, Mama, please don't stop, please don't stop, please don't stop. But invariably, if it was very hot or very cold, I would. And we would take Mr. Fuller home. 
on the bitter cold nights, I would make rice and chicken or something like that because I'm not a very good cook. But if you put enough salt and pepper in it, it's good. <laughs> and so I'd say, come on, boys, we're going to take this to Mr. Fuller. Oh, Ma, please don't make us go. Yep, we're going to take this to Mr. Fuller. They fuss, but I wanted them to learn that everybody counts. There's no better way to teach you for you to teach your children that everybody counts. No better way than to let them witness that and be a part of that. And I want you to know my boys now have had some thin Christmases. One has six children, the other has five children. And I can name them for you, I'll do that after, but I have to do it in order or else I'll forget somebody. <laughs> Every Christmas they bring to me a hundred dollar bill. Sometimes they had to work extra for it. And they say, give this to somebody that won't have Christmas. And they trust me to find them. They don't want to know who they are. And so I have begun now dragging my grown grandchildren into that. Where's your Christmas offering? We gave it at church. No, you didn't. I know you. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to come by with your Christmas offering. And then I take the little ones with me. And we buy they want to give it to them. They want to see the people and get to know, know you're going to see them in school. That takes away the gift because you think you're reaching down to help somebody. You need to reach out to help somebody, not down. So we carry on the tradition, but the boys fussed about Mr. Fuller. One day when I went to see him, he gave me money. One much, five dollars, ten dollars, something like that. And he said, We put that in the offering plate. Um, Mr. Fuller, don't you need this money? Probably not as much as a preacher. <laughs> I thought he was right, so I took his money. <laughs> bed was covered with blankets, old mattress he had found someplace drug in, and the blankets he had been dumpster diving to get those, and there was as much tobacco spit on the blankets as there was spit on the floor, and you had to be careful or you'd slip down. And I usually tried not to sit. I usually tried to just kind of stand around. He'd say, you want something to eat? Uh, I'm good. <laughs> because he had a kerosene heater with a stove pipe, kind of like this, that went up. And he had one pot, and he would take that pot, take it outside on the doorstep, and he'd hit, hit, hit until most of the stuff came out. And he'd set it up, and then he'd open a can of Denny Moore beef stew or some kind of camel soup or... Um, whatever somebody had given him that was left over, he'd put in that pot and he'd eat it straight out of the pot. But he did have two spoons and he would offer me a spoon. <laughs> I always knew that if I ate with him, it would taste a little bit like a wafer and grape juice. But I never could get up the courage to do that. Uh, wish I had. We did share a swallow out of his only water jug once or twice. Well, I asked him that day when I was there, how did you get to live like this? And he said, I, I can't really tell you, except it just sort of happened and now it's comfortable. It's hard to change, he said. The devil you know is not as scary as the devil you don't know, he said. He was a veteran. He had a decent pension. He had social security. He didn't have to live that way. But change for him was hard. He could have lived very differently. He could have had what we call the comfort. But life had been hard and he didn't want to change. And he said to me, I'll never forget him saying, you think you own that house, but that house owns you. He was right. 
Well, that's kind of where Peter was. He was comfortable. The text that I just read you finds Peter kind of of the same mind as Mr. Fuller. Jesus had been teaching. He had sent the 12 out on missions. He had talked about having no extra coats. He had sent word to Herod without meaning to send word to Herod that he was in town and working miracles and raising the dead. He fed the 5,000. And Peter has declared Christ the Messiah. And then Jesus tells them all that he must suffer and die. We call it the passion. I bet the Episcopalians do too. And he challenges them. Whoever wants to follow me must deny themselves and take up their cross. And then he takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain. And we call it the transfiguration. Well, I preach this sermon lots of different ways and lots of my friends preached it a lot of different ways one friend always preaches it through the eyes of jealousy I don't preach it that way because it gets too close to home why Peter, James and John why always Peter, James and John why couldn't one time you take Andrew it, it, it always seems like Peter, James and John and why can't I be Peter, James and John are you with me preachers why can't I be one time Peter, James and John I know it's got to be that woman thing <laughs> got to be I don't like to preach it from that angle, but my friend does. I like to preach it more from the angle that the best work is done at the foot of the mountain. Now, it could be that we need to look at Moses and Elijah when we look at this text because they were in for a part. Do you know how to tell who came first, Elijah or Elisha? They're in alphabetical order. If you'll remember that, yeah. it will help you when you read the stories because you can remember which one came first. Uh, and it will help you when you're reading those stories. They were there, and I wondered what kind of conversation they might be having. having and um, But if you read it, you can overhear it. But Moses said, Jesus, you can tell them all you want to tell them. They're not going to get it. When I came down off the mountain, I had it inscribed on tablets <laughs> by the finger of God. I showed it to them, and they did not get it. And there it was, carved in stone. And Elijah said, that ain't nothing. I called down fire from heaven right in front of them, and they didn't get it. What makes you think, Jesus, they're going to get it from you? <laughs> and those two old men were right. The Bible tells us that they were talking about the departure. And Luke sandwiches this text between wonderful things that are going on, but right between two passion stories, he, he sandwiches the transfiguration. They're talking about Jesus dying on the cross and saving the world, and Peter doesn't like it. That's change. That's big change. That's change that they don't want to hear about, talk about, think about, struggle with. That's change. No, no, no. He was uncomfortable. He liked that glory. Let's just build three booths, and we'll stay up here, Master. It's good for us to be here. And then the voice of God came out of a cloud and told him, listen to Jesus. He's my son and you need to listen to Jesus. I think of Mr. Fuller. I knew every time I picked him up and put him in my car, and it smelled like Mr. Fuller for days and days and days. Every once in a while, he'd take a little bit of a bath at somebody's water faucet when he was doing yard work for him, but that was about it. And I have often said to my boys, I'm going to wind up giving him a bath. I know I am. <laughs> well, he got hit by a car. And they brought him to the hospital. And the doctor said, Hugh, 
We yeah. are not putting him in the hospital no matter what. We call the ambulance. We're sending him to the veterans hospital and they've been through with him. I said, please don't do that. He's got nobody to look after him. He doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have children. He doesn't have brothers and sisters. He'll be so far away from home. If we'll just get him cleaned up and get him in a nursing home, I know the church will bring him a fruit, fruit basket at Christmas. I just know they will. <laughs> so here was the challenge, and I was working in the operating room. You get him clean so the nurses can take care of him, and I will admit him here, and we'll get him in a nursing home. So I went down to the operating room, got an extra set of scrubs, came back and took everything I had off and put those scrubs on, and me and Mr. Fuller got in the shower. <laughs> he was naked from the top of his head to the tip of his toe, and he was a little bit embarrassed, and I said, Mr. Fuller, don't worry, don't worry. If I see something I hadn't seen before, I'll shoot it. <laughs> and I scrubbed him from the top of his head to the bottom of his head. I cut his fingers, I cut his toenails, I bathed him, I gave him a haircut. I scrubbed him till he shined like a new penny. Took three times before he could smell. Wow. I thought, I, how does this happen to me? God sends these people to me. <laughs> and we got him in a nursing home. I went to see him about a week later, and I said, Mr. Fuller, how's it going? And he said, you know, it was 8.30 before they came to give me a bath. <laughs> <laughs> every once in a while and, and sure enough at Christmas time he got Christmas fruit baskets and sometimes a little cake, a little slice of this and he died a happy comfortable man and I'm a better preacher do you understand what I'm saying I'm a better preacher because of him and when I was scrubbing all that miry muck off him I was scrubbing my soul and didn't even know did not even know. Jesus never called us to be the same. He never said, I'm going to fix you. I'm going to get you to this place in your life. I'm going to scrub up your soul a little bit. And you just stay right there and wait. That is not where he called us. And believe it or not, he didn't call us to the Methodist church. Or the Episcopal church or the Baptist church. He gave us a preference and he gave us mind and heart to decide what is right for us. What he called us to was him. And he said, you're going to spend the rest of your life changing to get closer to me, to get more like me, to being transfigured into what you need to be. Now that's a complicated process and we don't like it. That constant change. Just when we get our puzzle almost put together, something disturbs it, and we have to decide on another theological aspect or struggle with another saying. I give money to the church, and now I've stopped preaching and gone to Maryland. <laughs> I ran a pretty healthy trip to the church. Is it a tenth? Is it a tithe? And do you do it the first check, or do you see what you've got left over after you buy a new car or a place in the mountains? And Jesus keeps calling us and calling us and calling us, and change is hard. I'll be good to people. I'll even let them in the church. They can come and have a little meal every once in a while. Can you go to their house? Can you love their children? Can you make sure those children have the same opportunity as your children? And Jesus keeps calling us. And it's Lent. Well, I gave up chocolate. Well, that was big of you. You don't even like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus keeps calling us. And I go to church most every Sunday, but when it's raining on Sunday morning and we were up late last night and 
probably UGA was beating somebody else. <laughs> we had to stay up and see the ball game. I, I miss today because I go three Sundays out of four and Jesus keeps calling us and calling us and calling us. And it looks like we could learn like Mr. Fuller did. Once he got cleaned up, once he got his toenails cut, once he got into a clean bed with clean sheets, once all that happened, he got comfortable in it. It was 8.30 before they came to the door. <laughs> and if we will learn that every time we make the sacrifice and get a little closer to Christ, that all that does it, is make us more comfortable getting closer to Christ. And the sacrifice pretty quickly turns into a blessing. I had a really hard time when I went into ministry because I did a ton of volunteer work at the church. And let me tell you, and that really wasn't volunteer work for the church. It was really because there was this hunger inside me to do that work that it only satisfied a little bit of that hunger. Preachers couldn't stand me. And now I know why. <laughs> they knew I wanted their job, and no matter what they preached or how well they did it, I could tell them when the service was over what they did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or I'd say, what you preaching this morning? And they'd tell me, I'd say, oh, I've got a great story. Would you skip that? <laughs> Don't you know I drove them nuts? <laughs> and if they made me mad because I played piano for that little small c country church, I'd say, what you preaching this morning? Joy in the morning. Okay, well, if you if they really made me mad, then I'd sit down and play Precious Memories. <laughs> Just completely derailed. <laughs> and so even my volunteer work, you see, wasn't much of a sacrifice. Once I went into ministry, and people like you paid me to read the scripture, to sit for hours and study, to teach the Bible studies, to visit the sick, to take care of the Mr. Fullers, to challenge the congregation, to work with the trustees who always thought they knew more than I did. <laughs> Where was my sacrifice anymore? I was getting paid to do all that. And I struggled and I struggled and I struggled struggled with that because I'm convinced and am persuaded if you aren't making sacrifice to Christ, if you aren't changing for Christ's sake, then there is no sacrifice in your life. Now you can retire. I'm going to in June. Officially. But you cannot retire. If you're a Christian, there's no such thing as retirement because you will always be in ministry. You will always be in sacrifice. So my challenge for you this Lent season is start today and spend the rest of your life listening to God, obeying God, changing for Christ's sake, and being better than you are. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>